Hello, and welcome to Everyday Connection with your hosts, Rico Shields and Jean Victoria Norlock. Bringing your inner life to your everyday life. Welcome, everybody, to this Thursday edition of Everyday Connection. I am Rico Shields, and way over there on my left, Jean Victoria Norlock. How are you, Jean? I'm freaking fantastic. What? Awesome. Summer has come to the Quebec mountains, my Spring, friend. Please. Things are turning green and blooming, and uh, she's been out on her patio on the wireless headset while we've been doing our pre-show stuff that runs a half an hour. And um, mm. so she's been sitting out there watching the lynx run by and looking at her dogs like, why aren't you barking at the lynx? It's a big cat. And I'm thinking the dog's yeah. probably looking back at you thinking, yeah, really big cat. You bark at it. <clears throat> but you know. I'm really fascinated by the interplay that goes on around here between the animals. Um, it never ceases to amaze me how much they are willing to cohabitate until a human comes along and jacks with it. I'm just, and, and the more I get to observe it through my amazing space or in my amazing space I'm just I get it you know <laughs> I mean I really do I see all these videos coming up on YouTube and all these other places of these animals that people are catching on film playing with each other and they're supposed to be mortal enemies quote unquote um, and I'm I'm watching this happen in my own backyard I'm totally fascinated by it. I got the cat hanging out watching birds eat, birds eat, and not trying to jack with them. I've got the dogs hanging out on the deck with me watching a lynx prowl around, you know, and maybe 20 feet away, it just beyond the tree line. It's not <laughs> not far, you know. I, I could run down the stairs and touch the thing. Um, and they're just chilling, you know, as long as it doesn't come up and threaten mom they're good but if a human being were to walk down my lane there might be blood <laughs> i've heard the i've heard the cacophony when it happens it's uh it would scare me they Unless don't like you know yeah your dogs have big deep voices like going well, to eat they, you now they also they also have big teeth to go with the big voices yes and um great big german shepherds two of them yeah black my babies you wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley. I mean, at least Molly's got a little white on her. You might spot her, but Lukey's all black. Well, Lukey, no, no, Lukey's standard shepherd coloring. Ah. Um, it's it's Molly who's who's the night prowler, and she is. She's quite dangerous at night because you can't, even with the tail. I mean, you might just think that's a flash of something, something. Really, she's um, she's got these unique eyes. One's green and one's blue. It really shows up in the photography. They yeah. they glow oddly. She's my alien dog. She's got one glowing green eye and one glowing blue eye. And I tell you what, when she's coming out of the bush at you at night, it's enough to terrify any normal, rational human being. <laughs> like, I wouldn't. This is uh, this is a completely safe and protected space. I, I don't lock my doors at night. I have no need to, um, you know. And and but again, what I found most fascinating is that they have no problem with the wildlife. They don't care what crazy creature comes up and checks out the house. They just don't. They it's all good. Yeah, I mean they 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 kind of had their heads in that direction. They were keeping an eye on the lynx. And like you said, I think if the lynx had tried to come up the porch would have been ugly but as long as the lynx is out there sniffing around and they're just looking out there thinking well, we, what it's doing we do that what <clears throat> but exactly anyway. so you know I, it's a good lesson i think and and i guess that's you know before we get into tonight's show and welcome our amazing guests on it it's a good lesson if we're we're really paying attention to what's going out on in the world right now and we talk a lot about seeing the changes that we're seeing i think the animal kingdom has really stepped it up 
by way of setting an example for us. And it's it's definitely something to put our attention to that, you know, I mean. And, and, and be careful if, about what expectations you bring to the situation. Yeah, yeah, because and you expect dogs you, to be enemies with cats and you expect cats to eat birds. But they don't necessarily let go of it. Yeah, yeah, if you if you don't if you don't jade go your reality with ex- your preconceived perceptions. In, in, instead of going to expectation, go into fascination. Just be fascinated. Yeah. See what's going to happen, and it will almost always surprise you. But um, absolutely, absolutely. But that's good stuff. Um, Speaking of surprises, I'm surprised uh, at how quickly this man that we have on, this genius, this incredible human being, how quickly he managed to get me to uh, click into sacred geometry. Yes, because you pronounced to me prior to the show that, you know, I, I don't math geometry. No, no, no. You, in fact, <laughs> when, when we started talking to Charles, uh, Charles was with us once before in a group, uh, so we felt it didn't do him justice to have him for just, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, but she typed to me on Skype, right? When he got on that, that, you know, okay, you're going to have to talk to him because I don't know anything about this. And about 10 minutes in, she, you know, Skype lights up with all caps. I get it. I get it. <clears throat> like, see, I told you, this is the guy. <clears throat> and, uh, all you got to do is go to YouTube and punch in sacred geometry. And Charles is going to be, it's almost always the number one slot for me, but if not, it'll be you know, three of the top five. And uh, so uh, there's a there's a reason for that. YouTube doesn't just put you up there because they think you're cute. Um, <laughs> it's it's the views. And even if the views are because you're cute, you got to be getting the views. And, uh, uh, and he is cute. And I will say... I got I to gotta throw that out there. Oh, oh um, yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. I, I will say briefly before I introduce Charles, which who really doesn't need much introduction, but um, a couple of people are reporting sound problems. They have still uh, been – they're still playing with things a little uh, on the player at uh, Blog Talk. So if you continue to have trouble, right under the play pause button is a play in your default player. And for Windows, for example, that will bring up Windows Media Player. Um, and uh, I have found over the last couple of weeks going to visit other people's shows to see how the sound is working, that that has worked for me when oftentimes the blog talk player cuts out every minute or two. But some people aren't having trouble, so I think it depends on where you are, who you are, and who knows. Maybe I'm expecting it to be bad. I I try not to. We t- did we just talk about that whole expectation thing? We oh, yeah. did. I have to go back and listen to my own thing, show, so. I guess. I think once in a while you might want to do that, Rick. Yeah, <laughs> Don't so. do as I say, I have eight, do as I do. I have 18 of them on the list that I'm going to listen to over the weekend looking for sound clips. So y'all watch for uh, some new uh, exciting videos coming on our YouTube channel. But enough about us and our show. Uh, I know that folks are excited to uh, uh, get right into it, and I certainly am. Uh, I have uh, followed with appreciation Charles' work for – some time, and uh, like a lot of folks, you know, made friends on Facebook, but I don't just, you know, somebody accepts a friend request and you go, hey, I want you on my show. You just, you know, take it easy and everything happens. Um, and so we have with well, us tonight divine time. Charles L. Gilchrist. How are you, Charles? I am really, really good. I'm really excited about being here. Can't wait to uh, talk and talk and talk. <laughs> That's awesome, and and uh, we're, we're we'll be wrapped with attention. We have a lot of hellos coming in the uh, in the chat room for you. Uh, cool, and uh, uh, we've got a good good crew in there tonight. Some new folks, and for for, for you know new folks, this is kind of the atmosphere. It's a conversational thing. We like to think of you know our virtual sandbox or virtual campfire, and we just kind of hang out and and chat, and we let spirit figure out what we're going to talk about. And, there you go. It always goes awesome. But uh, welcome, sir, and uh, just thrilled to have you, you with us tonight. I'm uh, I'm really excited. Like I said, I, I, I'm very very pleased that uh, we're doing this. Another chance for me to uh, to uh, have some kind of positive effect on the on the universe, which is really what I'm about, you know. And and we do love that about people. Um, the more we do this, 
the more we realize that there are so many out there that are having yeah. a positive effect on the universe. Oh, there goes the dog. So that means there goes Jean, and, and of course, I was <laughs> blowing my nose. So, um, you know, we try to figure out when the other one's going to talk. It doesn't always work out. Um, so... Uh, so sorry. It ah, happens. here she comes. I was just about to ask your <laughs> ask the infamous famous question. first question, oh. and uh, but here you they, are. They quieted down just in time for me to ask it. So, um, can't believe I'm asking this <laughs> of you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. Who on earth are you, and what do you do? What do I do? Yeah. Yes, sir. Who on earth are you, and what do you do? Who am I and what do I do? <laughs> I'm an artist. Uh, I've always been an artist from the time I was little. I, uh, that's all I claim to be. I don't claim to be anything other than an artist. And uh, uh, I knew, I was completely convinced that I was an artist for, uh, by the time I was three and a half years old. I was absolutely sure. And I had a, a really powerful, what you could call a mystical kind of experience when I was uh, three and a half, and that experience uh, convinced me that I was uh, that I was uh, a born artist, and that uh, I also thought of it, of it as a gift. I thought that uh, uh, God, whatever that is, uh, what did I know at three and a half back in uh, Wichita, Kansas, in 1940? You know what I mean? I mean, Wichita, Kansas, in 1940 was like, uh, well, that was actually 43, but. In the 40s was kind of like, uh, well, brother, where art thou? The movie. <laughs> you, you guys see that movie? <laughs> yes. And in fact, I was yeah, born well, in Liberal like, Kansas, so. Well, liberal, there you go. Liberal you know, Kansas you know is, is uh, tinier than Wichita. There you go, and it's kind of like Mon Pa cattle back then, you know. And uh, it was very simple, and and to be an artist was not uh, not exactly the way my parents uh, saw. Their son, they Less. had these all these, they had these different ideas about because you know, what did the conservative family in Wichita, Kansas, know about artists? Very very little, except what the media told them, and and they told them that uh, artists were men and being uh, rowdy, rising drunkards, which would probably cut their ear off, uh, and uh, you know, so naturally you don't want your kid to be that. <laughs> Of course not. But uh, yeah, but uh, I resisted. I resisted, and and uh, I got I fell off the track, you know, here and there. I got I I got uh, trained into being a, a somebody. I went into somebody training, like we all do, you know. And society teaches us how to behave and what to be like and what to do and what not to do and all these kind of things, you know. So I I had to try to buy into that, but. I never really totally did, uh, but I uh, I slowly got uh, more and more and more uh, demoralized by the by what I was experiencing as a as a young kid, and I got uh, very uh, turned off to uh, to religion. I I, I became uh, more and more discontented with I didn't see a demonstration of. Uh, of what I thought uh, Christianity was supposed to be, I, I saw exactly the opposite, and I got more and more discouraged, uh, more and more uh, uh, disheartened, and uh, there was I was conflicted. In other words, I was conflicted, like we all are, you know. And I didn't really know what was going on at all. All I, all I knew was I was angry. I got more and more enraged. I became uh, an atheist, even for about half an hour, <laughs> 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 until I realized that there was, uh, you know, there was definitely, well, maybe there was definitely rules bigger than me, and there was something running this whole thing. But so I couldn't really call myself an atheist, but I did, uh, I did make a, de- a deal with uh, with God, so to speak. I said, okay, you don't mess with me, and I won't mess with you. You know, so I I lost the uh, I lost my intimate connection with spirit that I had when I was uh, very, very young, as a, as a very young boy. I lost that, and I and I got more and more uh, uh, 
uh, agnostic, I guess, or kind of secular, secular, you know. And uh, I bought in. I, I bought into the whole deal. I I, I thought that uh, you know the material world was the answer, and and I was very very ambitious, and uh, I wanted to make a lot of money, and I did all the things that the that the society told me I should do for many many years. And uh, by the time I got to meet my in my late twenties, I was very very unhappy, extremely unhappy. I had done everything that uh, that all the pundits told me I should do to be happy, and I should have been happy. I had I had a wife, I had a car, I had a I had a home, I had children, I had I had a career, I was making more money all the time, and, yet, and three point two kids, full, white picket fence, yeah, exactly. the whole nine yards. Everything, and I was I was completely unhappy, and I I had no idea why exactly, except that there was this huge internal conflict going on, which was trying to get out, you know. And uh, when uh, in in my late twenties, uh, if any of you out there are interested are interested in astrology, you know, there's this phenomena called uh, Saturn returns. Does any do you guys know what Saturn returns mean? Rick, Rick, I do you well, know? I, have a, I have a basic idea, but I I don't I on the refresher for Gene. Definitely lacking in my uh, in my astrology knowledge. Yeah, um, well, well uh, uh, the the natal chart is a is a map of where all the planets were in relationship to 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 your particular point on the planet that you were born in. That's called the natal chart. So at the moment you were born, all those, all the planets and all, all the various uh, uh, bodies in the heavens are in, in, a, in a particular relationship, which can be mapped very accurately, and that's called the natal chart. And because Saturn is a, a, a distant planet, it takes a really, really long time to come all the way back around to that natal position. So it takes about 20, anywhere from 28 to 29 years for that to happen, and it's it usually uh, uh, indicates a, a challenge, a challenge in your uh, whole life. It's like a, it's like a, a stressful a period that forces you into making some decisions, making some changes, or not, you know. And uh, so I didn't realize this at the time because I, I hadn't didn't know anything about astrology. But it actually, uh, you could pin it on uh, Saturn return. So I started feeling this uh, this intense kind of uh, strain about. This, uh, something I didn't understand. It was all subconscious. It was all hidden in my in my uh, you know subconscious world, and it was uh, messing with me. But I didn't understand. I started having dreams, uh, uh, very lucid, uh, very highly uh, vivid and uh, memorable dreams, and they all had to do with my death. And uh, I started getting the idea that uh, I was going to die before my thirtieth birthday. And uh, they just kept getting worse, and I get more and more paranoid. I started looking over my shoulder for, uh, you know, a sort of madman with a gun, or, you know, I was expecting a plane to fall out of the sky on me or something. You know, I really did feel that I was going to to uh, croak. And uh, uh, on my on the on my birthday, at the eve of my birthday, my thirtieth birthday, which was June seventeenth, nineteen. 70, uh, I had another one of these dreams, and I was uh, being chased by unknown uh, uh, evil forces through a uh, very surrealistic city, completely disoriented, and at one point, I was hanging on to a lamppost trying to figure out where I was, and I, I looked up, and above me, uh, hanging over this building, was a giant crate of uh, of heavy chunks of metal, chain, and all kinds of stuff in this big crate. It was on a winch, and it was hanging above me, and all of a sudden, uh, flash. I'm in the sky. I'm I'm looking down, and I can see this crate right over the top of me, and voila, the ropes break, and the crate falls down and crushes me completely flat. So I, I it was a, you know, a nightmare, and I woke up in the middle of the night, uh, 
uh, you know, breathing heavy and, uh, uh, you know, gasping for breath. <laughs> you know how that's, what that's like when you wake up from a horrible nightmare. And, uh, and, uh, what it, it was after uh, midnight. So it was, it was my birthday and I got up and, uh, out of bed and started walking around in the house and I'm going like, what the hell? was this all about? Here I am. Now I'm 30 years old and I'm not dead. And it really pissed me off. If you, if you can imagine that, because <laughs> what the hell was this all about? All this suffering about dying and all this bullshit. You know the, and here I am. Cut that out. Would you? <laughs> it, was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, I got pissed off and I started hollering at God. I was actually, what the hell do you think you're doing? This is not fair. I said I would leave you alone. Now you're messing with me, you know? And uh, I started uh, praying to, to God, actually praying to God in a very ferocious kind of a way. What is this all about? I am really angry. I was, I was actually livid. I frightened my children, my wife, who thought I was insane. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, and so what actually happened, though, was for the first time in about uh, – Oh, I, I, I stopped talk, I stopped praying. I stopped having any relationship with uh, with deity when I was 12 years old. So I was 30, you know. So that what was that? It was 18 years, huh? 18 years, and I never prayed or never asked, never had any connection with spirit in any kind of personal way at all. All of a sudden, I'm screaming at God. I'm I'm, but I was praying, you know. Suddenly, I'm good praying. for you. <laughs> Good for uh, you. Was, uh, you know, the well, and you were trying to keep up your end of the deal. You said, you don't mess with me, yeah. I don't mess with you, so you just put it out yeah. of your mind. Exactly. And suddenly, uh, you know, so I had, there were, there had uh, that uh, same day, so I actually got really emotional and I really was crying and, and uh, I just kind of wore myself out with this whole thing and kind of got numb and then later that same day there was a there was a impro- uh, there was not was an impromptu there was a party for me which I didn't know was going to happen all of a sudden the relatives started showing up my friends they started showing up and there's a party and the kids and I forgot the whole thing you know so in this party I got a, a, I got two books uh one was called uh what was it called it was a book based on uh on uh, on Joseph Campbell's work, it was called. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it. I can't. I'm sorry. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, it was a famous book of the time. It was about a dream interpretation, and and uh, I, I thought that was uh, amazing that I had gotten this book about dream interpretation, which was exactly the problem I was having. And then I got another book, which I still don't know who gave me. And it was uh, the Maharishi Mahishi's uh, book uh, about uh, transcendental meditation. And um, I had uh, mm. somehow uh, somehow I put these two together, and I thought that it was an unbelievable coincidence that I would have gotten two books on my birthday that were addressing the very areas that I was most uh, interested in. You know. Uh, uh, Self-investigation, and one of the most important things in, that I saw in this in this book by the Maharishi Mahishi Yogi was that there was a graphic in there, and it showed uh, it, it was an illustration of consciousness, and uh, it was the the sea of an ocean, and bubbles would come up from the uh, bottom of the ocean and come up and come up and come up and and finally break through the the water and, and become part of the air. And they, they were making a relationship to uh, consciousness, how all these uh, archetypal ideas are bubbling up from the center of our uh, being, from, a, from the roots of our consciousness, which is, which is really God. And uh, that was a new idea for me, this internal aspect of God. That was a completely new idea, and it, and it blew my mind. And uh, at the same time, this, all this information by Joseph Campbell, really incredible information about mythology and uh, dream interpretation and uh, archetypes and all kinds of ideas, which uh, also blew my mind. So these two books together seemed like a miracle that I 
that I had received this information on the very day, the first day that I had prayed for answers, and I actually get the answers on the same day. That really, that really totally shook me up. And uh, uh, I was sitting at a table. I remember very clearly. I, I was sitting at this table. It was really late late that night, and my my kids were asleep. My wife was asleep, and I was reading these books and. All of a sudden, I have this clear audio kind of experience, and uh, 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 a voice says, uh, uh, look at your hands. And I, it, it shocked me because it sounded like somebody was right behind me, and I, I turned around, and I, I couldn't see anybody. And uh, I said, oh, my God, this brandy is better than I thought it was, you know? Because <laughs> I was sipping some brandy, and... Uh, which is another gift I got from my brother, a really beautiful bottle of Napoleon brandy. So I was sniffing on that, and then, uh, uh, I, I turned back to the book, and and, and the voice says, uh, look at your hands. And uh, <laughs> so I looked at my hands, you know, and and I, I could actually uh, see way into the skin, way further than I, I normally could. I could see the flesh in my wrists, I could see down into the tendons, and my hands looked uh, semi-transparent, and it was really uh, kind of like a, it was kind of like an acid trip, you know, only I, of course, I didn't know anything about that, I was completely naive to any kind of uh, drug-related uh, uh, tripping, but uh, but I was tripping on my own, so to speak, you know, and uh it's uh and it, this this kind of uh new rebirthing kind of experience that I was going through uh lasted for two days and uh it was uh tremendously powerful and, and in those two days i I remembered the the little boy that that was so completely dedicated to making art as as a spiritual as a spiritual um uh, uh requirement as a like a that went with being an artist you know I, I thought that being an artist had some kind of spiritual relationship when I was little I remembered that and I I suddenly just turned into this person that I had been I remembered this person that I had been and and and, and, and now who was I you know and it was a very traumatic period of time I, I was it was a schizophrenic crack up actually you could call it and uh, it was very much uh, like a classical kind of breakdown. Now, if I would have been born in a Native American tradition, uh, they would have just taken me to the shaman, and he would have uh, figured out whether he was going to exercise the demons which were in me or integrate them. And, and then if, if they were integrated, then I would have become a shaman myself. But that wasn't the way it worked in in you know Wichita, Kansas, in 1943, or or even in it, it, it doesn't work that yeah. way anymore. It, 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 uh, now, it, even uh, shockingly enough, actually, a uh, young uh, my sister daughter, I call her, just had a shamanistic um, her 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 Experience. basically a shamanistic uh, ceremonial awakening, except for she did it without help naturally in the middle of a city and ended up getting committed and picked up by the police. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I knew, I knew my, I knew myself uh, when I was going through this, I knew that if I said anything to anybody, they would, they, they would have me in the booby hatch right away. And, and so I, I hid this, uh, I hid this from my family, from everybody because I was so ashamed. I, it took me two. it was a two year period of, of, uh, really, uh, really schizophrenic, uh, trauma. Uh, and uh, I, I, I got through it myself. If it wouldn't have been for uh, the uh, transcendental meditation and, and my and my and the studies that I, I started there during that period, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made it. But uh, it, it, but at the end of the two years, I I did um, rededicate myself to to that vision that I saw when I was a, a young boy, and I rededicated rededicated my life to. Uh, to a spiritual connection, I, I felt an intimate connection with spirit, and and, and that's when I, I got on the, back on the path, so to speak. You know, so then I had to go through all the 
adjustments and all the, the changes in my mind to integrate uh, my original personality with this, with this personality, personality which the circumstance had created uh, for me, if you understand what I'm trying to say. I hope I'm not Absolutely. getting too modeling. No, no. I I I love that you're you're being so open and honest about this actually because part of the reason that we do the show is that the people who are out there listening who are going through their dark night of the soul as some people would call it or midlife crisis right, with right. other people. So, I mean there's a million terms for it. Um right. And and it is it is a shamanic awakening really and um from my own understanding of of Native American traditions and teachings and my own studies of them, I recognize it quite easily. I've, I've been through it myself. So mm-hmm. has Rick. And the the reason that we do this show in the way that we do is so that we offer an opportunity for people who have, have made it through to the other side, um, fully intact and fully whole mm-hmm. and fully aware of their, their personal gifts and their, their self-worth to be able to stand on the other side and say, it's okay you're going to be fine. You're not crazy. Um, you're not, you know, you're, you're, you're not losing it. You're not in danger in any way. This is a transition that is part of your natural spiritual growth and you right. can either embrace it and, and allow the changes to flow and come to you or you can fight it and do what Rick and I both did, which was make ourselves very, very sick for a very long time. But, <laughs> the reason go. for us doing doing that is because we know that it's it's not an easy transition sometimes to make, especially when you're coming from teachings or a background that disallow for you to integrate this inner knowledge into your everyday life. Some some of exactly. us like you are married with a family. Uh you know, right. we had jobs, careers. So how do you how do you take this awakening and explain that to your spouse because the person you become is not the person that they married and if you're lucky your spouse backs you up and and grows with you but sometimes you have to let go of everything in order to step into the truth of your being and it's it's scary as hell let's let's be honest about it it's scary and it's we just want to be there to tell people that it's okay you're not alone you're not alone at All all We, so many. Well, I, I thought I was. I, I thought I was. I thought I was totally alone, except for this uh, spirit guy that had that had showed up there on my on my birthday. He he was still with me, and he 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 guided me uh, the whole time. Now I I know uh, from a holistic point of view that uh, at this point in time that that uh, it, it, for me he it, it, it felt like a completely different. Uh, entity like a uh, like a spirit like a like a guardian angel or something like that. I didn't believe that. I mean, he knew everything, and he he advised me absolutely perfectly for for two years, and and I totally trusted. And he was the closest thing to a guru that I, I have ever experienced because I absolutely blindly trusted what he was telling me. Except that at the same time, I still had all this uh, karma built up from this other personality that I had you know, that I had developed and there was huge conflicts. And, uh, I, I was like, I was desperate. I, I got so bad at the end that I actually attempted a suicide and, uh, I, I didn't make it. I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't, fortunately I didn't, it didn't work. I tried to crash a car. I crashed the car. I killed the car for sure, but I didn't kill myself. And, uh, the car didn't, uh, <laughs> make the it. car didn't make it, you know, but I did. And, uh, so I mean that was a miracle right there. But uh, uh, when that happened, then my guide uh, showed up and he says, "Okay, uh, here's your assignment." And he, he gave me an assignment and he, he disappeared. And he uh, he said, "You got to work on yourself. You got to work on your bad behavior. And uh, you got to work on 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 your anger. You got to work on anger management and your bad behavior. And you got to become more civilized, more civil." Because I was not, I was not a, a, fun, a fun person to be around during that period, and uh, I was, I was, I, I discovered um, a a book by Ken Kais Jr. Have you ever heard of Ken Kais Jr.? Either one of you? No. Uh, yes. No, yeah. oddly enough, oh, he he probably has. He's read them all. <laughs> no, no, I think there's one. He, uh, on the shelf. 
he wrote a famous book. It was very famous at the time, and it still works really well. It's called the Handbook to Higher Consciousness, and it's a system. It's a system which uh, allows you to reprogram your uh, your uh, thinking uh, by by uh, 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 upgrading your addictive uh, behavior into preferential behavior, uh, and it, it works really well. It worked really well for me, and I, I, I used it, and, and I became instantly more. Uh, successful and, and and infinitely more um, happier during during the period when I was studying Kai's. I still use Kai's. I still use that same book uh, occasionally to as a reference. But uh, uh, that uh, that lasted for uh, you know that that first period of that first period of where I was readjusting to this new personality it lasted for seven years. It took me seven years until I made the next big uh, breakthrough. And, uh, uh, so, do you mind if I do you mind if I stop you just for a second before you go on? Can no, we talk a little bit about that? Um, about what? Because especially in our our work and what we do on the show, we encounter mm-hmm. every once in a, in a while somebody who is in that transition phase and who is it's almost like they're bouncing back and forth through two different realities: yeah. the reality of who yeah. they want to be and what they see, and the reality of their old world. And so. You know, I'd love to hear your take on how people who are sharing those people's lives can deal with them in a manner that is does not degrade or I, I put down their their old way of seeing things while encouraging them to embrace the new way because you don't want to tell well. them that they're wrong. Is, well, is the, the thing, thing is, the thing is, I, the thing, the thing is, I was wrong. I mean, I mean, I found so many things about me which I, I thought were despicable, and I, 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 I couldn't live with them, and I, and I had to change them. I, so, I was very critical of myself, and I, and rightly so. I mean, I was a chauvinist, uh, racist, uh, chauvinist, uh, racist uh, materialist, and uh, uh, you know, I, I had all kinds of. Um, Baggage from my early training, and uh, I, I had to face every one of those um, every one of those uh, situations, and uh, you know, alchemize them. And uh, uh, that's so. It, it's it's not easy. I mean, some, sometimes you do have to change. I mean, as your consciousness expands, you have to let go of things that you were holding on to in, in the past, which don't work and are dysfunctional. And, uh, oh, that's absolutely, what I work on. and I, I agree with that. But the change came within, from within you, and it, it can't be, you know, it can't be forced. So sometimes when you're when you're dealing with somebody who's in that transition, I mean, you have to be very gentle and have well, some allowance for their back and forth bouncing because they're going to back and bounce back and forth between what they know and feel safe. Because it feels uh-huh. safe to be in that anger and resentment, because that's all they know. And this new trusting energetic, um, this this faith, for lack of a better word, because that's what we call it, knowing faith. It's scary over there, because <laughs> you don't know. Very, very scary. Plus, very scary. Plus, it, it, it forces it, it forces the paradigm. It forces the change. It forces the paradigm. And and I don't believe that you, any paradigm can be bridged without some kind of suffering. Uh, Precursing the changes. I mean, you, people don't change for no reason. If there's no reason to change, they won't change. But if there is a, a powerful enough reason, they will change. And it usually happens because you've suffered enough, and you don't have to suffer. You know, you don't no longer have to suffer over that because you fixed it. And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, that, that this uh, spirit guide uh, taught me when when he when he gave me my assignment, he told me number one, you got to work on your behavior. You got to work on that, and so I, I I believed him. And then at the same time, he gave me an assignment. He told me that I was to study all the religion and philosophy that I could possibly read from every uh, part in the world. Only I was supposed to study it in a particular way, whereby I was uh, um, assigned to find the similarities, the consistencies, the underlying. Uh, perennial philosophy, so to speak, that was embodied in all the great uh, philosophies and theologies. And so that's what I did, and I, I became a, a student of uh, history, of uh, religious history, and uh, a student of philosophy. 
and, and the idea was not to absorb any one particular uh, person as, as having all the answers, but it was to glean the answers through, glean the consistencies that came through uh, all these great uh, faiths. And uh, meditation was uh, my 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 godsend. Med- meditation saved me because I I, I learned how to to uh, cultivate the witness position, which is a critical critical uh, area that you got to work on in, in order to advance your consciousness. Uh, and, uh, and and that's what I was working on. And and then, but the real thing is that I was still in, in those in that period when I was adjusting in those seven years. Uh, I was still a victim. I still felt like I was a victim. And that, I believe, is a really big key when you bridge that one. When you start, when finally in uh, 1978, I had another really huge breakthrough where I realized that I was creating, I was creating my experience of the universe. And I had nobody to blame for it except me. And that was a gigantic breakthrough to take responsibility of the quality of your life and not blame anybody or anything, uh, you know, in any way. Ooh. Just it's a hard one. Total re- yeah, but I, but I saw it. I saw it and I bought it. I saw it and I bought it. I saw the truth of it. And that's when I, uh, that's when I started studying uh, hermetic philosophy and, and uh, turned on to the concepts of alchemy. And, and I believe that whole, the whole business of, uh, Turning lead into gold is, is is a completely mental, internal process, and that's what we're supposed to be working on: finding the lead in, in ourselves, and polarizing that lead in, into gold. And, and that's what I've been working on uh, ever since. And I just keep uh, expanding. Mm, well said, sir. And, uh, uh, but uh, then, uh, being an artist, um, see the, the important thing about being uh, this whole artistic process when I. When I woke up when I was seventy, and I and I rededicated my life um, to to making art, uh, I I was interested in, and I had been interested since uh, I was a teenager in the surrealists. Um, I consider the surrealists to be a, a really potent uh, movement in the twentieth uh, century, probably the most potent movement, because the surrealists were looking inside their own psychology, they were trying, it was about self-investigation. Uh, and and uh, I really, I really was drawn to that. And so I, I became a surrealist. And as a surrealist, I was, um, I was tapping into, uh, to, into my own uh, inner workings and my own archetypes. And I was studying uh, uh, Carl uh, Jung's work extensively. And, uh, and through that process, I made a whole series of drawings uh, uh, and paintings, and there was a, a point where uh, I, I, I perceived that uh, that the consistent messages that were coming through this uh, this surrealistic work that I was doing were geometric in nature. They were numerological and geometric, and I I thought, aha, that's what I'm going to work on. And I started uh, meditating on on geometric forms in my work, and that's what uh, really, truly opened me up and uh, pointed me straight at sacred geometry. And and when I found that, I went, aha, a little big light went off. I said, oh, this is the truth I've been looking for. This is the content that I've I've needed all these years. And and that's what I I, um, totally fell into and, and become seduced by and uh and and uh your piece of the puzzle I, spring. It was a big piece of the puzzle. And and uh, what happened though the, the the really important part though that I want to try to get to, I mean I could go on and on but I'm trying to make this as fast as I can. Uh my my interest in, in mandala making and, and uh, uh pure geometry, pure archetypes of geometry uh, was an unbelievable key in my whole uh, evolutionary process and my whole healing. It was a healing process for me, huge. And, and during that during that those, that period, I mean, I was still a materialist. I was still uh, I was still uh, you know 
uh, trying to make as much money as I could. And I was a commercial artist at that time, a commercial photographer and a graphic artist. And um, I was very well known, pretty successful. And uh, I uh, eventually just um, got to the point where I, I, I realized that the commercial world wasn't satisfying me either, and I had to go uh, full-time as an artist. And so in by the time uh, 1981 came around, which was uh, uh, 11 years after my rebirthing experience, I, I actually gave up the uh, commercial world altogether. And, and, and since that, from that period, I haven't done any kind of commercial work that I didn't want to do. I really got just tired of selling, uh, you know, taking my art, taking my talents, and, uh, you know, I felt like a prostitute selling stuff that I didn't even... Bending them to somebody else's in. images. Yeah, you know, ten, pa- ten packs and toasters, you know, and, you know, just meaningless, meaningless stuff, relatively meaningless stuff. Yeah. Compared to this aching, and compared to this aching that I had to discover the ultimate truth and, you know, the ultimate beauty, you know? Well, and it, it takes and, me uh, back to your first... The first words after Gene asked the famous question, you said, "I'm an artist." Yeah. So you right, have to artist, you man. have to be an artist because it's what yeah. you be. And yeah, I could, didn't but really but have a choice. I've but. fought against what I what I be for many years. I put there up a go. valiant there effort. <laughs> he did. Yeah, I know, but so did I. What I find you know. fascinating is is that you took this journey without. And this is so key and so important for for people listening, um, that you took this journey step by step without knowing where it was coming out. I mean, you didn't get somebody coming to you at the beginning and saying, okay, here is your destination. This is what you have to work towards. It was quite literally gifts of here's what you're working on now. Here's what you're working on now. And it's, so it's all about the stepping stones. So take this right. step now and deal with this now moment, and then you'll get to the next step. And don't worry but about what's know, over the hill because it's still going to be there when you get there. But, you know, but here's the real – there there was one aspect there in the very beginning which I, I, want, I definitely want to talk about. And that – in my studies of, uh, of the uh, great religions of the world, uh, every single one of them, Every single one of them is pointing to this possibility that human beings can experience, which is uh, this this an intimate connection with uh, source, with spirit, with uh, God, if you will, with uh, the uh, infinite radiant is whatever you want to call it. Or that, that it's possible to have this uh, union with uh, with the Maker, so to speak, the Gnostic experience, so to speak. Are you following me? Absolutely. I um I'll send you a copy of my book tonight. Uh the first book I wrote was all about the only thing I was told about what I would be doing with the rest of my life was that I needed to find the commonality in all religions, all beliefs and I needed to find a way to respect that and to show that respect uh-huh. for them through my work. And that's all I was told. I didn't know I was going to be on the radio or write books or any of it. I was just told right. find the commonality, seek that. But, but the and but the buzz the the the, the extraordinary uh, rapture of of, uh, of actually experiencing uh, gnosis, which is what I did in that in that on that first night when I was thirty, I actually experienced emerging with uh with with spirit uh you know I'm it was a real thing it was an intimate thing it was uh, sensitive to me it was responsive to me. And uh, it was such a, 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 a such a, a lofty, lofty, uh, completely peaceful and beautiful uh, buzz that I, I that's what uh, was always um, uh, directing me. I was trying to uh, purposely, on uh, by will, uh, affect my own consciousness so I could uh, experience this more, and which is which is exactly what happened. And uh, through that process, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I didn't really, I didn't think much of humanity during that period of time. I thought that uh, we were as good as uh, like in the dumper. I thought it was a, a 
cruel, wicked, uh, horrible uh, world filled with uh, greedy avarice, you know. And I, I didn't care anything for humanity at all. I just was completely self-absorbed and uh, uh, willfully self-contained, uh, doing my thing without any thought about humanity in any way. And and through the process that, that I experienced, I got uh, more and more and more uh, happy and more and more loving and there was a, a certain point where I had this kind of shamanic breakthrough where I, I was in the I was in the uh, in the cave so to speak I was in my own psychological cave uh, and suddenly I said oh my God this is heal- I'm healing this process is healing me I'm I'm healed I'm ha- I'm happier I'm alive I'm vital I'm you know contributory I'm I'm all these things. I can't just sit on this. I have to share it. And uh, right. that's when the that's when I uh, came out of the cave, came out of the off the mountain, so to speak, and decided that I had to figure out a way to pass this information on. And you know that, and that's what's uh, you know driving me. Uh, besides, you know, there's one part of me that loves to make art, and it's very private and personal and intimate. But it's uh, but there's this another part of me that just have no choice but to share um, what I have to to explain to share, you know, uh, because I think I can do some good, and that and that's what I've been doing for like oh, uh, some some place around uh, the year 2000 or before in the 90s, I started uh, trying to express myself, trying to talk about sacred geometry, trying to. <laughs> what was really weird, <laughs> I think this is really funny because, <laughs> excuse me, when I first started talking about sacred geometry, I would talk to people and I was so enthusiastic and so excited, but I was trying to talk to them about things that were that didn't even have any words. I, I, I could not find the words to express what I was experiencing in, in, in this process of, of mandala making. And, and and I would talk to people and I would I would go I would but no no you gotta listen, this is this is fantastic. It's, and I'm going on and they would be and they would be uh their their eyes would glaze over you know in about five seconds. And and they would uh look at their watch and say, Oh gee Charles, I really would like to talk to you but I really got another appointment I gotta be to, you know, and they would disappear on me. And I realized how difficult it, it really was to talk about something so incredibly abstract as sacred geometry. And and, and all these years, I've been uh, developing uh, the language and and the uh, the correspondent languages that that help people uh, bridge the this this gap to to these incredibly beautiful and 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 uh, totally universal realities. Uh, called sacred geometry, and uh, that's that's what I try and, to do. I try and, to keep it simple. And... We're really truly blessed that you do because um, the work that you're doing is so needed, and and you really have make it. You made it simple enough that people can look at it and find a connection with it, and right. that's. That's a real gift that you're you're offering that. So it's time, I think, for a quick music break, and then when we get back, um, let's get into the gift itself. Let's talk about okay. the basics of sacred geometry, and um, you know, you can dumb it down for us, simplify, uh, simplify, simplify. <laughs> Well, it's one of the beautiful things about uh, the most the most fantastic thing aspects of the universe are really absolutely completely simple. They're so simple that they go right by everybody, and and most people uh, want to make it really complex. But it, it, but sacred geometry is is not complex. If you start at the at the root and you go from there, it just unfolds like a beautiful flower. It's not uh, it's not it's really really not that difficult. And you don't have to know anything about math, math to understand it. it. You know, you really don't. It would make sense because it's it's a completely natural 
yes. natural aspect it's, of our reality. It's so everywhere it all around sense, you, all the time. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. That's what happens right, well, when people turn on their chicken. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We'll have some music break. Huh? No, it's okay. Let's, uh, <laughs> right. let's, let's play a special song. Um, okay. Good. In, Ho'oponopono. In, absolutely. In honor of our connection and our gratitude for this amazing planet that we live on. And, really? Um, but, yeah, absolutely. So we're going to have a quick musical break, and then when we come back, we're going to Get down and dirty with some sacred geometry. Take our keys right into the All right. meat of the All right. Right subject. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is our dear friend Ina V with her song Earth Prayer that's based around the Hawaiian uh, healing practice known as Ho'oponopono. Um, and, yes, it took me about six months before I started pronouncing that correctly, so don't, don't worry about it. Just the Hawaiian healing stuff. And uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> Stay with us, folks. <laughs>
to the seen and unseen, those who have walked before and after, we ask your assistance to live simply. Please forgive us, for we know not what we do, and we thank you for all your help us. Welcome back, everybody. I appreciate you staying with us. Uh, that's our dear friend, Ina V. Uh, you can find her on the web at enavie.com. And we we love to play that song almost every show because uh, we love this amazing uh, living intelligent spaceship that we're living upon. <laughs> and, uh, and also, Ina V is doing some amazing philanthropic work with the proceeds from the sales of that single. So uh, go check her out. Uh, we'll have links on the archive at our website tonight, and of course it's enavie.com. But now we're back with more www.charleskilchrist.com, and we'll spell that out for you before the show's over. I promise. All right. So, All right, Charles. So um, before the break, we had sort of I reached this geometry thing. Yeah, and I yeah, made we you were, do it we once were, before, but. I'm I'm gonna ask you to do it one more time for for people like me who just don't get it. Yeah, I understand. Start start well, with the basics first, and. Well, for, well, before I do that, I want to say one, one uh, quick thing. That, that book that I couldn't remember the name of earlier, that was uh, part of the two books that uh, really helped me with my uh, rebirthing, uh, was called Man and His Symbols, which was a very famous book. You can still find it really important. It was feature, it featured uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, work in um, mythologies. And so I just wanted to put that on you. And I, I, I think that uh, in order to, uh, I think in order to really understand uh, sacred geometry, you have to be uh, willing to, to just uh, take in uh, some information that might be that might seem like it's out of the box, <clears throat> and it probably is. Uh, I don't uh, suggest that you automatically uh, buy everything I'm I'm, I'm uh, trying to say, but uh, I ask you just to to uh, digest it like you would digest an exotic meal in uh, Hong Kong or something, not even knowing what you're eating, uh, and uh, just you know take it in and. See what it does for you, and let uh, stick what sticks, and you know, pass the rest. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of my advice. But I think that uh, uh, one of the things that uh, one of the points of view that I have is that the the universe itself is is a holistic reality, and it's we're all uh, uh, intimately connected with everything else that exists. That's the whole principle of of the holistic concept, and that is uh, right at the at the roots of sacred geometry. So sacred geometry absolutely fits into any holistic system that you're already connected with, which is a big advantage. When you start to see uh, that sacred geometry actually relates to the to the to your own personal interests and relates to your own personal life, that, then it starts to get re- really important. You know, that's actually what it does. And I, I believe that the that the universe is vibration, basically. That's what the scientists have been telling us for a very long time. It's just waveform phenomena, and uh, it's it's all vibration. 
and you can see this vibration uh, as as a universal language. And uh, I believe that the universe is talking all the time. It's talking to itself in in, in these vibrations. Uh, and we don't need to know anything to understand uh, most of the vibrations that are coming to us. I mean, uh, sound uh, is talking to us all the time, all the time. I remember as a, as a small child living in, in, in Kansas, the uh, weather is extremely dynamic in the, in the plains, uh, very dynamic, and uh, lots of really interesting, exciting storms. And thunderstorms are part, were part of my uh, early experience. And there was a sound of uh, lightning as it's striking at a very distant, uh, in a very distant uh, way. It's a very beautiful rumbling uh, organic kind of uh, rumble, which which is uh, to me extremely beautiful. Now, if you take that exact same uh, lightning strike and 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 put it about a uh, hundred yards away from where you are, and it, and it goes off, it it's a completely different experience. And it's, it's basically the same sound; it's just ramped up in energy, and and it's you know shocking and horrifying and you know exactly you know how dangerous that that is i mean you don't have to have any intelligence at all you know and neither do animals they're like gone you know and uh so vibration itself is a language and it's it's a it's a language which which appeals to our to our sensitivities to to our receptive aspect of our lives and i believe that 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 is one of the principal languages of the universe the vibration itself and of course, uh, music is uh, you know another form of, of vibration, and and in in, and in these uh, uh, in music especially, you can feel the correspondence. You can feel the har- harmonic correspondences there. It's obvious. I mean, you don't have to know anything to appreciate that beautiful piece of music that we li- we just listened to. And uh, can can you guys give me some feedback here while I'm talking? Are you with me? We are with you. Absolutely. We're right here. Okay. So you understand what I'm trying to say? Absolutely. So this thing, sound, is is, is so beautiful, and 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 music especially is so beautiful because it, it points to to a correspondence in in energy and in, in vibration, so the harmonic correspondence. And this is what the uh, the ancients have been telling us for you know thousands of years that there's this. A har- a harmony in, in the universe, vibrational harmony in the universe, which is correspondent in layers, and that's what the whole uh, the essence of the Emerald Tablet is all about. Uh, uh, that which is above is like to that which is below, and that which is below is like to that which is above, for the accomplishment of the one. Huh? That's the that's the axiom, and uh, so harmony is the is the big is the big lesson there in, in, in vibration itself. And then on, on another another of the languages, of course, is um, mathematics. Uh, uh, numbers themselves are uh, totally universal, absolutely universal concepts. I mean, one is one, and two is two. You know, and they, it just doesn't change. The conceptual level of numbers just don't change, and they are forever the same, uh, always, uh, everywhere. So they're truly, truly universal concepts. And uh, you know, mathematicians can uh, see the entire universe in in, in uh, mathematical terms. And, but this is an extremely uh, left brain kind of a concept. It, it, it requires a, a very exacting rational uh, thought, you know, logic. Left brain is totally left brain. And, uh, <clears throat> but it is, it is a legitimate uh, universal language. I mean, uh, the early languages were, were, were uh, many of them were organized around uh, the concept of uh, vibrational, uh, the vibrational realities were seen in in terms of the mathematics, and that's where numerology came from. Uh, the Catholic uh, tradition is extremely interesting in mystical 
number, the mystical aspects of numbers. So that that's a very um, another language which is clear, clearly a universal language. But the the beautiful uh, language is is the language of form, which we which we call sacred geometry. And and this particular language is uh, appeals to both our intuitive sensibilities and our ration our rational capabilities simultaneously. So you don't have to know anything about mathematics at all or logic to appreciate the the forms of um, of sacred geometry. They just sing to us. And that's one of the most beautiful things about sacred geometry that I have um, found to be completely consistent. The vast, vast majority of people who are lighting up to sacred geometry uh, at this point in time are being drawn on an intuitive level. They they don't really light up from from uh, the map. They don't light up to the purpose. You see the forms, and they are enhanced by beauty and perfection of the forms. And they say, oh, aha, it's like a, uh, one of those moments, those aha moments, when you, when you perceive the beauty and the grace and the perfection of sacred geometry. So not only is sacred geometry appealing to us this way, but it's appealing to this other side of us, this, this left brain side. This is extremely unique. There isn't, there isn't almost, there almost isn't anything else that, that has the power to balance uh, our re- receptive energies to our, uh, to our lin- uh, linear uh, counting energies. It's a very rare thing. So, it, so getting involved with sacred sacred geometry is actually a, a way to balance between your intuitive capabilities and your uh, rational capabilities. So that, that's one of the uh, key points I want to I want to make about uh, approaching uh, sacred geometry. And, and I, I personally believe that uh, my my studies in sacred geometry have helped me integrate my um, the war, the internal war between uh, the left and the right, so to speak. The, the you could call it masculine and feminine. Uh, the conflicts that come out of those kind, that kind of thinking. There is no war left in me. And because of sacred geometry, I have learned to integrate uh, my left, my feminine capacities with my uh, so-called masculine uh, capacities. It's a huge, huge advantage. So I'm giving you kind of reasons why you should even care about sacred geometry. And, and uh, I think that's some pretty good reasons. Right. Well, it's, Absolutely. it's a physical, vis- visual representation of the marriage of physicality and spirituality. Yes, it is. And it's, it's so obvious that it's, uh, that it's undeniable. Once you, once you see it, it's, it's undeniable. So uh, where does sacred geometry start? Uh, that's, the, that's, that's the question, isn't it? Now, in... Uh, it can be a big question. It, I don't know if yeah. it's a point or a circle or seven pennies. It's something. Yeah, well, it, it, it starts, I mean, if you want to study sacred geometry in an effective way, you need to know the root concept. And the root concept is... Uh, uh, it comes back to this holistic principle of of, of oneness, and uh, uh, if you look at the whole history of, of mandala making, which is actually a universal, uh, I mean that that word is a Sanskrit word, uh, but it, it but the process of uh, making of, of understanding the spiritual power of, of geometry is a, is a and meditating on that is a is a, an absolutely universal. Uh, Understanding. I mean, virtually every every uh, civilization that's ever lived has been uh, using ex- sacred geometry to express uh, various concepts and to and, and find the correspondences there and and make them uh, make them uh, 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 work in their own uh, approach to spirit. And uh, in, in mandala making, the mandala actually is a Sanskrit word which, which means circle. 
<clears throat> but in, in Sanskrit, all the words have um, multiple meanings. They're, uh, they're, they, they are correspondent uh, words. So not only does it mean a circle, that means any circle. That means uh, you draw a circle in the dirt, that's a mandala. Uh, but it also means uh, the circle or you know, the universal reality of circle. Uh, it's, uh, and, and the center of that circle in uh, Sanskrit is called the bindu. So the bindu is the center of the circle. And the bindu is a, an expression of um, this single-pointedness, this oneness that we can achieve, this Gnostic reality. So uh, there, there have been... Uh, uh, there, there, there are priests and, and uh, monks, uh, shamanic monks, who have spent uh, X number of years pondering a circle on the inside of a wall, you know, with a bindu. And, uh, and it is said in the East that you could achieve enlightenment by, by studying the circle, uh, by meditating on the circle by itself, just the circle alone and the bindu is actually a path to enlightenment. And that's how serious they take uh, the bindu and the circle. And that is actually <clears throat> the root concept of, um, of, of sacred geometry. And, and the center of this circle is literally uh, an expression of what I call uh, the first dimension. It's, uh, it's the point which is everywhere and nowhere simultaneously. Uh, the center of the universe. If this is, a, is an expansive universe which has no uh, no end, which expands uh, forever, infinitely, so to speak, then any circle or any uh, single point in that universe, wherever it is, is the same center. You understand that one? Well, and when there's just the one point, there's nothing to compare it to. There's no, so that it's every, like you said, it's nowhere and everywhere. Cause nowhere it's, and everywhere. It's, if you want to, if you want to point, if you want to uh, point back to the Big Bang theory, which is a semi semi functional uh, way of seeing things, uh, there was a, a point, a, a moment in time, or not in time, perhaps where. Uh, before the universe was uh, manifest, that uh, universe existed uh, as a single point of uh, all potentiality jammed into this unbelievably um, infinitely tiny space beyond uh, manifestation, a conceptual awakening of, of deity, so to speak. And then, uh, voila, this single point uh, divides, blows up, so to speak, and bam, the Big Bang, and we have vibration. Can you follow that one? Yes. That totally makes sense to me. Absolutely. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, if you another thing that the scientists will tell us is that this, um, if you if you buy into this uh, holistic reality, the universe has one thing. You can't add to this. You can't add to all that there. Is, all that is, and that's what the hermeticists, the hermeticists uh, talk about the uh, universe as being uh, all, the all. They call it the all, which means right. that, it, which means that there isn't any possibility of adding to that all. So because if all, that is, all is was, all. <laughs> all is all. Exactly. So if all is all, and it's expressed. In this in this moment of of oneness, then um, then the universe has to be uh, formed by division by the division of this oneness. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it makes totally just totally in alignment with how how I view things. I just <laughs> never viewed that as being in alignment with sacred geometry until you started right, talking. So, but but, there, but yeah. it, there it is. <laughs> Excuse me. So yes. this division. So this division of the single point marks the division of the uh, the division of oneness into duality. 
And uh, right. if you study all the if you study all the great re, uh, great uh, religions, there's always two aspects of the theology, and it's always about the the conflict between unity and the, uh, and duality, which is us, right. you know, here and there, up and down, left and right, good and bad, uh, you know, uh, hot and cold, all the rest of the dualities. And there could be no vibration without uh, without this division, and and in, in and in geometry, this is expressed as the division of the single point. All of a sudden, two points, and energy happens between in the division in this big bang, so to speak. It is a tremendous unleashing of uh, attraction and repulsion kinds of uh, potential. So. There's two kinds of energies that can happen between uh, these two points in, in geometry, and that is a radial energy, a pushing and a pulling that goes back and forth between these two points. Can you follow that? Yes. Bouncing back and forth. What about you, Rick? Are yeah. you with me? Back and forth? You bet. So there's an attraction. On one hand, the, on one hand, these points are trying to be forced apart from one another, on the other hand, they're they're trying to be attracted to one another. So it's it's just, it's just a counter uh, counter by, or counter radial energy back and forth, a push and a pull between the two points. Now, simultaneously, these points can also uh, also exhibit another kind of energy, which is an arcing energy. So not only do these points want to push and pull or, or, uh, away from one another, but they want to spin around one another. So you have the, you have these two beautiful express you have this expression of these two root energies of the universe which which can be expressed geometrically as the radius and the arc. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Absolutely. How about you, Rick? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So. What this is, what you have here is you have a, a, a beautiful expression in sacred geometry of what the East calls the yin and yang. Because in, in the yin and yang concept, this is the twin uh, forces of the universe, the twin energies of the universe expressed in this uh, yin form, which is a, a counter-rotational uh, spinning energy that creates these these two forms called the yin and the yang. And uh, so the radius and the arc, which is which is the root energy of sacred geometry and the root energy of the universe, actually, is, is expressed uh, uh, just as that, radius and arc. So if you want to, if you, you can take anything that exists in the universe and you can uh, strip it down to its barest essentials and you have an interaction between radius and arc. Now, if you hold the, if you allow these energies to happen, and you hold the uh, the two points to a given distance, and and you let them spin and push and pull uh, against one another, they create a circle. Can you see that? Absolutely. You guys see that? There is a bell. Clear as a bell. Oh, that's good. I'm, I, guess I must be saying the right things. Uh, <laughs> so, so, the circle, so the circle is the is the first enclosed form of sacred geometry. It's the first icon. It's the first enclosed icon. The, the bindu is the first icon, but the first enclosed icon is the circle. You understand? I do. Right, the first time that you get inside and outside. Exactly. So now, so not only, but but here's the thing: these two points that create the circle, they are they are actually clones. Each one of them has all all of the potential of the other one. They are not diminished in any way. Each is completely equal, and each can uh, each can uh, uh, ex- behave exactly the same way as the other one does. So not only does point A want to rotate around, or point B want to rotate around point A, but point A also wants to rotate around point B. And when this happens, you have this famous uh, 
icon of sacred geometry called two circles of common radius and the vesica piscis, which is that football-like shape that happens in between two circles when they have the same radius. And I, I know that's a little bit abstract for people to see, but it, you could easily find uh, you could you could Google you could Google uh, vesica piscis and two circles of common radius. You would find you would find it all over the place. It's in my uh, videos all over the place, and it's in my work all over the place. So you can't miss it. Uh, are you following me? You guys know what the vesica piscis is? Absolutely. So it's, I, I can it's actually picture that. Yes. You can picture it. Okay. So the yeah. whole, the whole, the whole, uh, uh, but what happens when you, you, you overlap these two circles is it, it, it makes two more vortexes, which are two more points. So then you can do more circles and more circles, and suddenly you're like, you have this ex- infinite explosion of this two dimensional conceptual reality, which creates the germ of life, the seed of life, the flower of life, the fruit of life, and continues infinitely in this pattern, which I call nature's first pattern, expands forever. You understand? Yes. This is a, this is a two-dimensional reality. Now, this is a conceptual two-dimensional reality. It doesn't really exist. Uh, I mean, a perfect circle does not exist in in the, our three-dimensional universe. It exists in the two-dimensional universe, but it does not exist in the three-dimensional universe. If you understand what I'm saying, right? Because because it's because the relationship between the diameter of the circle and the circumference of the circle is a is a what's known as a irrational number or, or it also could be called from a mystical point of view a, a transcendental number which means that it, it that that relationship does not resolve mathematically and continues forever and we have this thing called pi you know 3.141 blah 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 yeah and they forever. used computers to to do thousands of digit places and still nothing and they can and they can't ever find an end to it Infinite. Now, so what? This, Imagine that. So, 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 what this is beautiful. Well, why this is beautiful? Why is this beautiful? Why is this important? Because the circle itself points straight at the mystery of the universe. In, infinity is is an unbelievable mystery which we cannot solve. Our rational minds cannot grasp the concept of infinite infinity. We can think about it, but we can't really. It's beyond our, our capabilities of resolving. And any time, <clears throat> excuse me, many, many, many of the, of the aspects of sacred geometry point to these kinds of relationships, these unresolvable relationships. So at the heart of this beautiful, perfect language called sacred geometry is, the, is this constant reference to something beyond the finite mind, something that we will never be able to understand, the magic and the mystery of the universe. The, this, would be, this would be deity beyond our capabilities of ever understanding. Does that make sense to you guys? It makes sense in that something inside me tells me that I'm just not meant to understand that in this physical form. How can you how can you how can you think about the zero? How can you think about infinity? I mean, there aren't any, if if there is something some kind of aspect of the universe which is beyond which is beyond vibration, which is zero vibration, no light, no darkness, no words, no numbers. How can you even – you can't even say anything about that because when, because we as abstract uh, thinkers, as human beings with abstract uh, capacities, uh, have created this thing called language, and, and, and there isn't any language in the zero either. How could we say anything about it? We can't. How can we know anything about it? We can't, not as finite beings. And that is a, a wonderful, beautiful expression of, of – uh, the unknowable, uh, and I, I believe that all the great uh, teachers have, have recognized that this, that the universe is um, at the end uh, incredibly mysterious and unfathomable. No, unfathomable. 
So it's right there, right in the heart of the earliest parts of sacred geometry, a, be- a beautiful expression of, of this of this uh, reality of of uh, the unknown, the absolute unknown. It's very, very beautiful. <clears throat> it is beautiful. Now, and, uh, and, and, and essentially all of the other forms, uh, at least in beginning, before you get into solids and, and, and things like that, you you have mm-hmm. those two circles, and then mm-hmm. the and then they the circles rotate around each other, equidistant, yes. and you end up with this next form that is got a bunch of circles in Vesica Pisces or Pisces. An or, infinite number, an, an infinite number, an infinite number. Yes, it's and, and no man, and, and another fractal. thing too. Now listen, it, not almost fractal. I mean. I, I'm not really sure, absolutely sure, what the mathematical uh, definition of fractal is. If, if, but I'll tell you this: sacred geometry acts like a fractal. It all reduces inside itself and expands, expands outside itself infinitely, out infinitely in. So it, it, it behaves. All the icons of sacred geometry behave like fractals. Even right. if they aren't technically mathematical fractals, they still behave exactly like fractals. In the to, so, to try to be simple with people with, with a fractal, you might see some strange pattern, and then you can focus on one little part of that pattern and zoom in. You'll see the whole pattern over again. It goes on. Yeah, and it just ever it goes on forever, forever, and forever. That's exactly what sacred geometry is like. Like looking at two mirrors <laughs> or something. Exactly. So what I see, what I see, the, this uh, mathematical, uh, this, the mathematical reality that, that the scientists call fractals, is just an, uh, an expression, uh, a very uh, advanced expression of sacred geomet- geometric principles. That's the way I see it. So uh, there's a there's a definite connection between uh, complex fractal uh, realities and simple sacred geometry. And here's another thing about that we want to think about this pattern that we call nature's first pattern, this infinite interlocking network of circles which expands uh, forever and uh, expands and contracts forever. Uh, same thing, no matter where you are in that pattern. If you go, if you if you start at one of those points which is in that pattern and you move uh, uh, four clicks out uh, to another uh, to another point in that pattern, you're actually at the same point because it's still the center of the universe. It's still the same same center of the pattern because it expands infinitely. Right. So no matter where you go, I mean, uh, Wavy Gravy, one of my old uh, <clears throat> uh, friendly clowns from the 70s, a hippie clown, uh, used to always say, uh, remember, no matter where you go, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. And that's exactly that's what sacred geometry is like. No matter where you go in those these patterns, you're still at the same place. Because it's it really very, it comes down to each one of those points is a clone of the original point. Yeah. So it doesn't matter which point you go to, it's the same point. It's exactly. confusing, but you got it, it. it is it it's the same thing from a different view. Exactly. You're exactly right. And uh, now here's another thing. I think I mean uh, I don't know what uh, time is. How much time do we have left? Oh, well, we we we've got about uh, we ten fifteen minutes. We we leave us ourselves yeah. a little breathing room at the end of the show because that's when the brilliance okay. always comes. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, uh, so this is a, a, another thing that I want to talk about. I mean I could go on and on for hours for days. I could talk about this for days and days. I mean that's all. It's okay. We, we'll I mean, have you back. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the, the, the thing about this is, you could literally study this uh, sacred geometry uh, for for lifetimes and and never uh, never come to the end of it. It's 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 it's, it's, it's outrageously rich. So I couldn't possibly even begin. I mean I think I have begun to introduce you, but the possibilities are endless and the the conversations are endless about this. But there are a certain a couple of things I want to uh, I want to bring up that's really important, and that yes. is uh, <clears throat> these forms. And I'll think about this. I am absolutely convinced that this universe is uh, 
the whole thing is consciousness. It's all consciousness. Uh, and uh, even even at the atomic level, uh, you find these um, little knots of energy uh, called the atoms. Uh, they display preferential behavior. Uh, for instance, oxygen just loves it just loves everything, and oxygen will hook up with almost any of the other atoms and uh, uh, form some kind of an, uh, a new uh, consistency, uh, a new energy uh, called a molecule, and uh, by preference. Whereas some other uh, of the atomic atoms uh, do not particularly like to go with anything. And and uh, this, gold, this for example, happens. just likes to be gold. Exactly, it just likes to be gold, and it doesn't want to change into anything other than gold. And you got to force it to even, uh, you know, act like it wants to do something else. But uh, so that that is an that is an expression of preferential behavior. And when you find preferential behavior, you find consciousness. I mean, plant consciousness is beyond uh, is beyond uh, you know beyond arguing about. I mean. Uh, con- uh, plants are they're not self conscious of course but they have pre- they behave preferentially that leaf will follow the that leaf will follow the sun all day long in order to get the most heat onto that leaf now what is telling that what is telling that leaf to bend like it bends towards the sun that is an expression of the, the uh, of uh, the various levels of consciousness in the universe uh, all the way from the coarsest matter, all the way up to the finest matter. And here we are. We're in the. We're 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 human beings. We we exhibit a certain level of, of consciousness in in this universe. <clears throat> and uh, now this is the thing. If, if this universe is consciousness, then life is everywhere. And I have no doubt that there are an infinite number of planets out there that have the capacity to. Uh, to to uh, the circumstances, the physical circumstances that would support life, and I'm sure that wherever that happens, there is life. So I am assuming that there are uh, ascension creatures in this universe other than we are, other than us. And if we would ever come across them, the thing that we would have in common, the the absolute root thing that we would have in common would be. The bindu, the circle, the radius, the arc, pi. And this would be the basis of, uh, this could be the basis of, of communication with any ascended creature in the universe. That's how serious sacred geometry is. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It can't be any place else but everywhere. These are omnipresent, omnipotent realities. And that is very heartening to find something that is unchangeable, unchangeable and perfect forever. Try to find something like that in this universe, you know. Geometry fills that fills that necessity that we that that goal that we need to find some kind of truth. There it is, right in your face. And these forms are so perfect, they actually exist beyond time. They are space beyond time. That means that the circle has always been the circle and it always will be the circle. And when you contemplate this from a uh, spiritual uh, point of view, you set yourself up to psychologically align with uh, eternity, with, uh, with uh, uh, perfection beyond time. And you, you enter into a, a realm of, of God mind, so to speak, which is perfect and unchanging. It's a main line, straight to the source. The study of sacred geometry is a main line to the source of all. And it is a portal, a doorway, a, uh, a reliable meditational doorway. And uh, I can guarantee you that from my countless thousands of hours uh, being at one with this, with these ideas. Uh, 
So there you have it. Do I have and a couple more minutes? Sure. We've got uh, yeah. we've got about five more minutes, uh, more or less. I mean, uh, that can be six, that can be four. Yeah. Uh, have, I, have I raised if I raised any questions that you have, uh, or Eugene? <laughs> well, goodness, <laughs> yeah, that's sort of like mm-hmm. asking somebody at the start of a show, "Who are you and what do you do?" Those can okay. Well, okay, we can well, we could spend let's, months answering those questions, each of us. But um, I'm actually, I'm right. actually just kind of sitting in a in an awe moment. So I'm I'm gonna let you guys banter for a minute, and I'm gonna. I'm going to USA in that all moment for a minute because I, you've taken yeah, I got, me got from. And, and yeah, I, I was going to say just then when the pause came up that really as brilliant as your translation of these concepts into words is, and it is brilliant, let me tell you, um, it's really something you almost have to just be with, meditate with. I know yeah, when you, you hang out with it. When you draw some of your, uh, in fact, there's a photo of you with a, the outline of a uh, a large uh, piece that you did on, uh, I guess, uh, somebody hired you to do. Uh, it kind of yeah. looks like Metatron's cube, but then by the time you're done, there's lots more on it. And you're just standing there with your hand on your on your chin, just looking at the outline. And I yeah. can imagine you probably do a lot of that as you're putting these yes i do yes if i do ideas I, I, on when, when, canvas. when i uh i just want to, that's a good that's a really good point a really really good point thanks for bringing that up because my whole process of creating art is a prayer it's it's prayerful and it's ritualized and so when i uh choose a an archetype to uh contemplate what i'm actually doing is i'm i ask i ask that form to teach me about itself that is that is the prayer that I have when I when I first begin these uh, meditations on, on these mandalas. It's actually uh, a prayer to inform me uh, to inform me about the nature of this form and and uh, the uh, the incredible detail that I that I use in the um, to uh, in my work is, is has two purposes. One is to create a, a luscious kind of a textural uh, candy that you can that you that satisfies your eye visually, so you can wander around inside this mandala and all these beautiful forms and shapes inside this uh, more these more simple shapes. That's one of the ideas. It's seductive, but the other idea is that it's like mantra. So the the, the hundreds and hundreds of hours that I put into my pieces are uh, they set me up for a transcendental experience. And uh, d- very deep open-eyed meditational experiences, which and, and in those experiences, I receive ongoing um, uh, revelations, and I also experience uh, the Gnostic reality. So it's like the most unbelievable joy and education that uh, that I've ever experienced, or I ever hope to experience. And that's one of the reasons why I recommend that people just hang out with this. And, and if you want uh, templates, I mean, I have templates on my website. You can download templates for free and, and color these things. I say just hang out with them and let them talk to you. Don't listen to me. Let, listen to the mandala itself and see what it tells you, you know? That's my advice. Hang out with sacred geometry. You'll fall in love. Right, because it it it, it truly is, no matter – it, it we, we can't – we can't depict the first dimension without putting it in two dimensions. We put it on a flat piece of paper. Right. And so you really can't quite uh, get to it. Uh, you can get close. And like I said, your um, words are brilliant on the subject. And, and I'm sure due to the amount of time that you've spent just being with these concepts. Um, yes. As I recall, you have a uh, 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 on your site basically the pages that can be coloring books. Yes, they're free they're and, templates. Uh, I call them mandala templates. And and the mandala is an, is an ancient form. It's basically a circular image of some sort that runs through a lot of ancient uh, 
practices, cultures, I guess yeah. you would say, cultures and yes. practices. Um, in Native, various, uh, Native, yeah. Every every culture, basically every culture. The oldest symbols in the the oldest uh, glyphs in the world are spirals. The oldest <laughs> glyphs in the world are spirals. We actually saw yes, some we, of those. We, we were. We did. Go ahead. And, and discussed them while we were in Costa Rica with Rosemary. Uh, she took us to, down to the the school and showed us the rock and um yeah, I, I was explaining the the fundamental um representation of of the universe of universal expansive energy that's yeah. circular never ending that that the the spiral or sometimes the dot in the circle represent is the all like like you said earlier um right. and I, I just I'm 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 in my stunned Usa moment cuz I can't believe having studied that so early on in my own journey that I never equated that with yes. sacred geometry. I can't, like, I'm just, so it's going to take me a while to kind of integrate that. And of course, of but that's course. okay. I'm looking forward for, I'm looking forward to it. That it's kind of like, how did I not see that? You know, like, like you said, it's yeah, right there. It. It's so simple. It's so yes. simple. How did I not see it? Yeah, isn't that interesting? But, and then the, there's one more point I want to make that's really important. In this two-dimensional world, this two-dimensional world that we were talking about, the uh, nature's first pattern, for instance, what it turns out to be is it actually turns out to be a two-dimensional blueprint of the universe. And this, this pattern, you can actually create uh, any number of form, three-dimensional, the, 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 the blueprint of any any three dimensional form through uh the through this um blueprint aspect that, that shows up in two dimensional sacred geometry. And what that proves, to make a long story short, what that proves is that two the two dimensional realm is a layer of God mind which is pure conceptual, purely conceptual. And in much like a template layer. Exactly like the blueprint of a building. I mean, you can look if you if you could read a blueprint in a building, you can build the building. You can build a three-dimensional building out of a two-dimensional blueprint if you're if you're uh, trained. And and the uh, uh, Metatron's cube, which is uh, which comes straight out of um, nature's first pattern, is is uh, naturally forms all of the platonic solids. Which are the first, which are the root three-dimensional crystalline archetypes of the universe, and so what that proves is that that this is a mental universe, and the three-dimensional reality has sprung directly out of these, this two-dimensional archetype held in the mind of God, so to speak, and it points to it points straight at the undeniability of some kind of creative uh, intellect. At the root of the universe, and it just destroys uh, atheism in a way. Yeah, well, it makes it very hard to, you know, there's there's a blueprint for this stuff, so somebody right. did, somebody must have, it it seems something, consciousness, the all, uh, because you can you sit there and look at the the seed of life or uh, particularly the flower of life and, and and as you stare at it for me anyway three dimensional objects sort of almost come up off the page and the, the yeah they do they there do. and they, the, the, yes they do the uh, yes they do tetrahedron is there the they're just icosahedron the dodecahedron all of them all of them and uh, yeah, so uh, so uh, what this what this uh, what this proves is exactly what the uh, exactly what the the quantum physicists have been talking about, you know. From one point of view, this point, this this idea of single pointedness, some of the some of the scientists are now saying, well, this Big Bang thing is happening. It didn't happen just once. It's happening all the time, constantly. Uh, these these subatomic particles are coming out of nowhere, and they they, they weren't there, and now they're there. And uh, you know, so it's. It's pointing at the same exact idea uh, of the Big Bang as being a, 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 a thing that happened in time as opposed to something that's happening constantly. Our bodies are re, rebuilding ourselves uh, 
you know, all the time, constantly, new cells, new everything, constantly, 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 rebirthing out another whole big bang all the time, every second, everywhere that exists. It's really heavy stuff, you know. Well, it is, and and that's what's fun about uh, to me, sacred geometry is the infinity of it. Um, yes, it you, is. You, like you said, you could you could play with them for lifetimes and not really. You still see new things. Uh, every time I think I every time I think I'm finished with it, you know, I go like, oh man, I can't. I, I've I've already gone through this. I can't do it anymore. And then I all of a sudden. Something happens to me. I see something I never saw before, and I just get completely excited again. And then I make a whole new set of mandalas based on that idea. You know, it's amazing. It's it's wonderful, wonderful stuff. And we will definitely have you back, sir, because, like you said, this is a an endless topic. Um, for our podcast listeners out there, unfortunately, our show is not. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, we're coming up against the time. And, and if if you hit your scheduled time, it just hangs up on everybody. It's really ugly. Uh, yeah. The way yeah. they handle it. But so. my qu- but my question is, did we have fun? <laughs> I think we achieved the goal of the show. That was the one. That's Absolutely. our only goal every night, every Tuesday and Thursday, is to have fun. And uh, I hope all of our guests did. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I've put the links up in here. The links will be up on our website in an archive, um, and that's at everydayconnection.me because it's all about me, whichever one of us me's says it. And, Absolutely. And um, so- Yet, if you're stopping by the website, and uh, we know that Blog Talk has been giving us a, a couple issues sound-wise during shows some nights, uh-huh. don't forget you can subscribe to us on iTunes by going to the website, hitting the iTunes icon. You can subscribe to us and get the shows delivered for free on your iPod, your iPhone, your your computer, whatever you so desire. And if you want to go jogging and listen to us banter, then go for it. Um, and and they're free and they'll Just be every, delivered every to you Wednesday by the next day. Every Wednesday and Friday, you'll you'll yep. have a new every. Day connection It'll on your iPod first thing in the morning. Absolutely. Just go to our website, click on the big silver apple. It, it's got headphones on. Big silver apple. Big silver apple wearing headphones. Craziness. Um, <laughs> and let's see. We have a calendar. We have people. Uh, we have. I've got it up so already. We've got Nadine Hayes coming on Tuesday. Um, the author who left it all behind and just said, "Screw it, I'm moving to Costa Rica." And now says she's happier than a billionaire. Oh. So Absolutely. That sounds worth listening to. Absolutely. And, and then uh, keeping with uh, the Costa Rican theme, <laughs> we are uh, hopefully, uh, what, I, what, I, what I hear is that we're speaking to um, some of the people that live at Serenity Gardens in Costa Rica. And we're going to be talking about eco-sustainable living and uh, what Jungle Life and Pura Vida are all about. So that should be fun. Absolutely. On Wednesday. So uh, and that'll be a special. We're gonna be we're gonna be doing some specials. We may eventually go to three shows a week because there's just so many cool people to talk to that we we run out of time. And uh, so join us again. Uh, we do hope that you will. Um, uh, I focus on our guests' links during the show rather than ours, but uh, do uh, do check us out. And you can always register at Blog Talk and just click follow. You'll get a notice of every one of our. Uh, uh, shows as they schedule. I try to schedule them not very far in advance so that you don't forget, because otherwise I forget. <laughs> but you can always go to our website and, and see our calendar. Uh, uh, it may just have a name on it, but we uh, fill it in best we can. Uh, but sometimes we have no guests past one week out, and sometimes we have three months out. So it just depends on what our executive producer does. That would be George. We call him. We call him George. George. But it's the all. It's the, it's it's the dot. It's it's dot. The bindu. George is a dot. Yeah, George is just a bindu. George, you've been through you. Uh, so anyway, come join us Tuesday. Have a wonderful weekend, and until Tuesday. To our mother, to each other, and especially to yourselves, stay connected. Good night, everybody. Thanks again, Charles. You're welcome. I had a wonderful time. We hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, visit our website at everydayconnection.me. And please like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash everydayconnection. Think you might miss an episode? No problem. Subscribe to our show on iTunes by searching for Everyday Connection Radio. Subscriptions are free, just like your everyday connection. 